Commander, Hail Ming approaching. What do you mean, Hail Ming approaching? More rocket Ajax is on our screen and heading right for us. Secure all posts. Raise all shields. Fire all lasers. Cue the music. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Hail Ming Power Hour. Yeah, I'm excited. Are you excited? <laughs> yeah, uh, no, oh. not at all. I'm actually kind of not, but but no, yeah, I am. Of course, I am. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. It's always fun to get back together. If you don't know who I am, then apparently you just haven't been listening to the show long enough, and you're a loser. I didn't mean to say that. No, no, no. It's it's fine. Uh, they, need Rick, <laughs> they need to know. They need to know. And they need to know. You need to know, people. Uh, I'm one of your hosts. I'm Rick. And along with me, the other voice that's not my subconscious, that's my other brother, Mr. Danny Bennett. What yeah, is welcome, going on? everybody. I'm excited again to do another podcast for some of my favorite movies and, and Rick's as well. And hopefully by the time we're done, it'll be your favorite movie. And, you know, if you, if you didn't like it before or you've never heard of it, man, run out and get it. Because if we recommend it, you can take that to the bank. And uh, last episode, we talked about the almighty RoboCop, the original, 1987, and we thought, hey, why not? Let's follow it up. I think we even mentioned it on the episode of, hey, let's let's kick out RoboCop 2 and just uh, see how it sticks to the wall. So that's kind of what we're going to jump into this week, and it's going to be a whole lot to talk about. Let's just RoboCop say that. RoboCop 2, man. I haven't watched it in a long time. There's going to be a, a whole whirlwind of things to bring up. So uh, that's going to be fun. But what we do is we jump together in our time machine. We go back in time. And in order to pay for that time machine, we have to have our sponsors. And uh, I don't know if, Danny, do you have any new sponsors it's, this week? It's a weird story, but yeah, I, I got a new sponsor for us. Cool. You want me to launch into that? I what mean, you got? <laughs> all right. Well, yeah. you know, so yeah. hit, hit, so hit. it's been weird times. <laughs> we're, we're, we're all kind of uh, sequestered and quarantined and, and all kinds of weirdness going on in our lives. And, and uh, I, I managed to get out. And, and when I got out where my, where my old Kroger grocery store used to be, there's this dilapidated new building. You know, it's got a, a weird red sign. And, and, um, and so I went in and talked to the manager and seemed like a nice guy. He grinned a lot. You know, he was kind of kind of a weirdo but but he seemed nice enough and uh he he said sure i'll sponsor your show um and he gave me this script but he said that i have to read it in his voice um so you know here here goes there's a new store in town are you tired of your current grocer come on in we have all shelves stocked it's like a dream have a mud at home our pet supplies are just right for that bitch Come on every Tuesday for our butcher's special. How sweet, fresh meat. And um, with stores opening every night, try the new grocer in town. Try Kruger's. I, I don't know. It was kind of weird. <laughs> the kids like it. The kids <laughs> like it. Yeah, absolutely. I just don't know if you check out uh, Kruger's weenie section, though. You may want to back off. Yeah, of there, there may be a pun in there that I don't want to be a part of, huh? Burt Weenies, $1 ooh, off. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> well, uh, you know, like you said, with these hard times, you, you kind of find out that our fellow podcasters out there are having to pick up some other work as well. And, and I found out our good friend 
Dan Beasel, who's a great artist, has done some artwork for for Hell Ming and stuff, has opened up a new shop as well, and it's it's Dan Beasel's Diesel Shop. That's right. It's got a oh, nice yeah. ring to it. So if you if you got any issues with your semi trucks or anything like that, Dan's your man. And don't forget that's Dan Beasel's Diesel Shop, where their motto is, "Need me to grease that rear end." Oh. I thought his uh, I thought his motto was going to be "I'll drive that school bus out of that explosion" because I, I didn't he didn't he do that for you once? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did the uh, the short bus in of a school bus that's uh, jumping across the bridge like Smokey and a Bandit. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Dan. He, yeah, he's a great fan too. I I love everything he's got to say. He's yeah. he's got his own podcast too. It's a great it's a great show. Corrupted Youth. You need to check it out. It's Definitely. a fun show. Him yeah. and his son. So there you go, Dan. There you got to. I think we could say we plugged you. <laughs> Dan Diesel's Diesel. You officially been plugged. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. We need to see if we can track down some actual commercials for Krugers. I think that's a great <laughs> idea. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll see what I can do. They're a pretty new business, so maybe they'll uh, they'll get started soon. Uh, so if we don't have any more sponsors, you know that's time for what did you watch? Uh? The lead in. The lead in. It's the lead-in. I got it right this time. <laughs> what did you watch? Did you watch stuff? All right. All right. You want to go first? You want me to yeah, go well, first? You know, I, I did watch something this week, and um, it was it's bittersweet. You know, it was a sequel I had heard about for, for years but never watched, and, and I finally made myself sit down and check it out. Um you know, IMDb says, you know, when a pup and his friend kitten take a dangerous turn, they're sure to find adventure and danger. So, you know, I, I, I can't say I recommend it, but uh, I did happen to watch Milo and Otis go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was not a fun watch, but it may be necessary, you know, poignant. Uh, it's, it's pretty good. <laughs> What did you check that out on? What was that on? I want to look that uh, up. It's on everything, man. I mean, it, it was, it was on, it was on my mind. It was on my heart. It was on my soul, and uh, I think I, I caught it on Amazon Prime actually. So give it a watch. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely be checking that awesome. one out. I've got. Uh, guess what I watched? That's right, a documentary. Oh, oh really? What about? Yeah, yeah. You you know I'm a fan. Well. This one is about uh, the processed chicken oh. world, and uh, yeah, and it, it's got Charlton Heston in it. And he goes undercover to find out the truth about the ingredients for chicken substitutes, which has become such a big hit in the fast food oh, market. Oh yeah, yeah. And then, and in the investigation, uh, is it's a year in the making, so they put a lot of work behind this, and it shows the disturbing effects of this product is causing, you know, to your health and everything else. And uh, the search leads us all the way back to the creator of the byproduct, whose name is Thomas Dick, and uh, the surrounding lawsuits that uh, that brought his in, his empire down. So that's Charlton Heston doing an investigation. So uh, you might want to check it out. It's on PBS, but it's Charlton Heston and the Dick Nuggets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, uh, if if I had just heard the title, I'd I'd have thought it was a, a band. Right. <laughs> Oh God! So, uh, be be looking for that one. Uh, yeah, Thomas Dick, uh, the creator of the chicken nuggets. That, that brings us to the end of when did you watch? Uh? What did you watch? Did you watch Dick nuggets. Oh. All right, folks, we're going to take a short break. The Hailming Power Hour is brought to you by Marsupial Planeteers. By your powers combined, I am Captain Kangaroo. And loyal subjects of Mongo like you. Hail Ming! New movie reviews all the time. See if these films age just like a fine wine. Oh no, we'll jack it up again. TV, games, and more with them. 
Rotten Tomatoes and IMDb are all the rage, but we'll lock those critics up in one cage. The Jacked Up Review Show, every Wednesday evening on Spotify, Podbean, Anchor, and other available podcast apps. All right, everybody, welcome back. That's right. We are going to make a trip back in time to 1990. Danny, you remember 1990? Vaguely. I mean, I. Not really, no. Yeah, it's kind of a flash in the pan. It, it, it was still being consumed by the 80s. You know, it still had that 80s kind of bleed over going over. And then you kind of get uh, this point to where from like 90, 91, 92 it was just kind of a weird time as far as movies and stuff. I think what I might remember most about 1990 is RoboCop 2, to be honest. Like, I mean, there's a lot to what went on, but it, it really kind of puts its, uh, its mark on that year. It's kind of trying to move on, like you said, from the '80s, but uh, but still kind of stuck to it in a, in a few ways that that made it just kind of awkward. But I think we do have a few examples in this movie of breaking down that '80s wall and moving into the '90s, if you like it or not. So what we're gonna do now? We're gonna jump into the time machine and travel back to 1990. Here we go. Strap yourselves down. For God's sake, strap yourselves down! You know, the time machine seems a little rickety lately. We, we need to find some more sponsors. Oh, oh, yep, we ah. do. Oh! I never get Purring used to the like G-forces. Purring like a kitten. Ah. Oh. Oh, that right. was a rough ride. 1990. Ooh, look around. Yeah. Why? Look at all the long oh. suit coats, man. Hey, there's a guy with a mullet. No big shocker there. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, shocker. Who left this lay in here? <laughs> oh, you know, I'm sure that they're not missing it. <laughs> all right. RoboCop 2. We have a synopsis for this movie, which came, comes... <laughs> I don't even know how to describe it. I'm so shocked by it. Uh, <laughs> is it is it Mitch Pileggi? It is not. It is not. It would uh, be good. It would have been so poignant. But what if I told you it was Marlon Brando? Oh. What do you get when you cross Kane's brain and an improved ED-209 unit that can basically walk upstairs? You get RoboCop 2. Cyborg law enforcer RoboCop returned to protect the citizens of old Detroit. Not the new one. He's a master. But thanks is a deadly challenge when a rogue OCP member, not going to say who it is, secretly creates a new evil movie title, RoboCop 2. <laughs> After Lewis guns down a criminal, RoboCop says, You are under arrest. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you can, you can say or will be used against you in a court of law. Lewis replies, He's dead, Murphy. RoboCop says, you have the right to an attorney. Lewis says, you're reading Miranda to a corpse. RoboCop says, I'm having trouble. Trouble indeed. But, good movie. It's a pretty good movie. Don't watch it. <laughs> oh, wow. Hey, let's Let's not have him back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. He's pretty spot on, I think. <laughs> We'll bring him back for the Island of Dr. Moreau episode. How about that? Oh, yeah. Are we going to do that? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. Of what's course. Your first reason to, what's your first reason to, to watch Island of Dr. Moreau? Uh, the end credits? <laughs> Ving Rhames? I don't know. <laughs> Courtney Cox? I don't know. How about the, 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 little, the little Vernon Troyer? Seeing that? <laughs> no. It's uh, it might, well. He might as well be. Wow, this is All this right. is so wrong. We probably need to keep We're moving. Right. Talk about. So movies. with that being said, I know it, it, this is one of those movies that kind of sparked our friendship here because we got to talk about this one. But yeah, Danny, what's your number one reason to watch RoboCop Two? Oh man, there's so many reasons to watch uh, RoboCop Two. I'm just gonna go with one that that's uh, maybe maybe a little unsung, but I'm gonna go with sleazy Kevin Nealon, right? The, uh, the the OCP lawyer who who like continually just like pokes at RoboCop's face and refers to him as a thing, 
and and he tells everybody, "Watch out! You're halfway to getting sued into oblivion." That this guy is just the epitome of the the sleazy lawyer. And you know, without him, you just wouldn't have anybody to hate quite so much. I think he's worse than the drug dealers. He's pretty bad. I mean, and that's a good description too. I like the, the Kevin Nealon with a ponytail, basically. So, <laughs> yeah, no doubt. I mean, he, he's the worst. Yeah, I mean, so you know, with uh, Miguel Ferrer getting knocked off in the first movie, you had to have another sleaze ball to kind of take credit for running RoboCop. So this is the guy they picked. Yeah, well, good choice. <laughs> I hate that guy. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of people you hate in this movie, you know? So uh, let's let's see. Uh, <laughs> my number one reason is the RoboCop 2 lineup. The other variations <laughs> when they're making the new RoboCop and they show the little video. Yes. And the, the robot comes out and like shoots himself in the head and the one pulls his head off <laughs> and screams and dies. <laughs> now, the RoboCop 2 montage. I mean, you know, A, yeah. it's, in, it's in stop motion. Yeah, because that was the effect they were using, and it's yeah, it is such a great you know, it, it's fantastic. Of course, they're showing the the owner of OCP sitting there just putting his head down with every every one they show, just like oh man, this is terrible. Yeah, I, I like but, the, uh, the 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 I like when they start that scene though. The scientist that's in charge of the operation, he's biting his nails like crazy. Yeah, <laughs> and he's like eh, eh, because he knows that he's about to get reamed for for just how much money this is costing and how many people get killed. <laughs> It's awesome. Oh, it's fantastic. So, what you got next, man? All right, next up, the mayor of Detroit. Yes. I mean, this guy, he's like, we're bleeding money like crazy. Bunch of people are dying. The cops are on strike. I mean, he just, he is, he is so entertaining as just the, the harried, like, goofy elected representative who just, he's in the worst situation possible. And, and all he does is just scream about it. Yeah, I mean, he, he's a high point in the movie. Every time he's on the screen, that's who you're watching. Uh, I, I've actually had him down as, like, my fourth or fifth reason to watch, Mayor Kuzak. And uh, he's fantastic, man. And I got to looking at, like, other movies he was in. He was in The Color Purple, but everything else he was in was pretty B-grade stuff. But uh, he knocks it out of the park in this one, man. I think he's a fantastic part of this movie. Oh, yeah, he played Harpo in, in The Color Purple. He did. Uh-huh. Yeah, nice. I mean, so, he's got some yeah. acting chops. He's just also really entertaining in kind of a silly way, you know? And he's almost a, a, a Tasty Taste character in this. It's like if yeah. Tasty got to, got to be the mayor. <laughs> tasty I mean, mayor. He's, <laughs> he's a little more pulled back a little bit, but just the, fa- the way that he gets in people's faces, like, this is not going to work. This is unacce- unacceptable. And just, you know, chews it up, man. He's fantastic. All right, my next one. It's kind of an odd one, but it's the uh, the self-driving cop car. This is the scene where our baddies in the movie, which I'm sure we'll get to in a little bit. But Oh, yeah. I guess just if you're a bad guy in Detroit, your hangout is always going to be like an old steel mill or something because it's almost like the exact same place that Clarence Boddicker and a bunch went to hide out as well. Yeah, it was but, probably uh, still public domain, so they'd go film there for free yeah, or something. exactly. And uh, so, but there's a scene where Robocop pulls up to the main entrance of the, of the the plant, and the door is locked. He gets out and breaks off the lock, gets in his car, supposedly, and his car crosses into the, the, the crosses the fence, and then it just blows up. And then you look back, and Robocop's <laughs> hiding. I'm like, okay, we saw him get in the car. We didn't see him get back yeah, out. Yeah, Robocop's of the car. kind of a Jason Voorhees of cyborgs, you know. <laughs> He doesn't move very fast, but he always seems to be somewhere that you didn't see him get to. Right. But the car just ex- it totally explodes, and it just it's rolling oh, yeah. across as it does. I'm like, wow, that car is self-driving somehow. That's not the first time in this movie that a cop car has been completely destroyed <laughs> with, with RoboCop starting out in it. So what you got? All right, so... so you may or may not know the the director of this movie is Irvin Kershner, who directed, among other things, The Empire Strikes Back, and whoop, and the whoop. story was by Frank Miller. Okay, my next reason is the whole opening sequence: the cops are on strike. <laughs> there's there are people looting things, people blowing stuff up. Two guys get guns out of a gun shop and shoot the owner right there, and then uh, two hookers beat this guy to death and and and, and kick him with their stiletto heels. And if you've ever read any Frank Miller comics, particularly Batman Year One, it's the same setup. 
It's yeah. just I mean, if, if you got if you got hookers and violence, it's it's Frank Miller. Yeah, you get the dude that walks out with the the homeless woman. Her cart flips over, and he robs her. And then he's walking down the street, and then they the 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 strippers beat him up. I mean, it's just like actually, I had it wrote down and see if you remember this or not. But remember the whole opening of Superman three? Yeah, I do. It's almost the same setup. Right. Yeah, except the, except except it's more violent. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's like it's like in Superman three though. It's like a little wind up toy, you know, go, going through all yeah. these little these little cutesy you know disasters that happen, um, where where you know Superman's oblivious. Th- this is this is hookers beating people to death. <laughs> it's like the end of RoboCop one, just kind of kind of segues right yeah. into this this horrible you know. hellscape that has become Detroit. You know. Tomato, tomato, you know. I love it. I love it, and I I totally oh, yeah. see where you're coming from. It's it's like just kind of a a pan through the city, and instead of it being kind yeah. of kind of wholesome and cutesy, it's it's just really dark, which is what you needed in yeah, 1990. Just, they were trying to like kind of break that, the mold. You can tell this movie is a little lower budgeted. You can tell that they cut back on certain things, the grand scale of everything, but. They they definitely gave RoboCop an upgrade because he's got like this prism color outfit now, right? Yeah. So he turns in certain ways and you get more of a flare where in the original it was just straight up silver. Yeah. So, yeah, it's kind of know, a bluish. Yeah. He got kind of a makeover here. That adds to it for sure. But I, I had that that's the first thing on my page was the opening scenes like Superman three. <laughs> oh yeah. There's no first to last there. These are all great reasons to watch the movie. And and you were saying it while ago, but the guys that are getting the guns and then RoboCop pulls up in the cop car, which you don't know it's him at the time. And right. the dude pulls <laughs> pulls out that rocket launcher <laughs> and shoots and the just, cop just car. Just for good measure, he shoots him twice with two rocket launchers. <laughs> well, he shoots him with one rocket launcher and then like a grenade launcher the second time. It's like, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's over the top, man. And just like, you know, he has A-team powers or whatever because he just kicks the door open on the cop car when it's burning and comes climbing out. It's RoboCop. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to, you know, this this podcast isn't all about, you know, uh, uh, applying uh, political theory to films. Uh, you can check out uh, Darren Wilson's The uh, Psycho Semantic Cast yep. for that. But um, I do want to point out that in, in looking for RoboCop 2 on a streaming service, I found a little 10-minute documentary that's all about how RoboCop 2 came out. And RoboCop had become like this this kids movie idea like you know even though it was brutal they had started selling toys and cartoons and and so they had a choice to make with robocop 2 either to to go that direction and make it more kitty or to go super dark and they they made a cognizant decision to make it super dark and they even added it to the plot where you know people wanted to you know well we'll get into that later but but um it's very overtly um intentionally dark To try and you know yep. get out of the tailspin of, of of kid movie that it was starting to fall into, and which is weird because I mean the first RoboCop movie is so bloody, man. It's I awful. Mean, it's 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 super gory. It's not a kids movie yeah. at all. But I and, guess they you, you know, know they were making toys out of everything then you know. But it was that thing though because my my stepbrother who at the time was I don't know six or seven years old was totally infatuated with RoboCop, you know. And so I I. I I guess it's just because it was the hip thing of the time. Even though it really wasn't a kiddie movie, kids were attracted to it. Of course, you know, you had everything else going on. You had all the Schwarzenegger stuff, the Stallone stuff. So the action aspect was already just a part of it. I remember my trying my hardest to get him to sit down and watch Star Wars, and he had no interest in it because they weren't shooting real guns, you know, right? like like RoboCop, <laughs> you know. And th- that's that was his... Probably his first movie type influence. He was, I mean, he was watching RoboCop nonstop and RoboCop too. It's just weird that you're saying that because, you know, I saw it firsthand that, that it had this kind of impact on kids. Yeah, and, I mean, uh, definitely, and that's kind of why I bring it up. I don't want to beleaguer yeah. the point. I mean, the, the point of our podcast is is check out the movie because it's it's tons of fun and it's a it's a great movie that stands the test of time. But I also want to point out, you know, that. This little 10, 15 minute documentary that this guy put together and probably has for free on YouTube is, is all about how the studio was trying to make it more of a kid's thing. And they actually wrestled control of it back and did and in order to, to try and stop that tailspin. They actually like 
made it something super dark. And uh, yeah. that's a reason why they have things like, you know, kid drug dealers and baby hostages. You know, it's, it's a, it was a cognizant effort to make it so bad that kids wouldn't want to watch it. So I, I don't know where we are. I don't know if, the, if it's you next or me next. I think it's you next. Yeah, yeah, I might have. Um, you know, I just kind of wanted to throw that in there because I, I thought that was really interesting. Um, you know, my, I'm just going to say it. Like, this is at the end of the movie, but this is what I think of when I think of RoboCop 2. RoboCop 2 coming up the elevator shaft. So, you yeah. know, RoboCop 2 isn't, isn't humanoid. You know, he's, he's got arms and legs, but he's got all these extra appendages and, and, and he's got, like, you know, like no face. And, and there's a part where he's down in this elevator shaft and he's fallen and he catches himself. And the next scene, RoboCop looks down and RoboCop 2 <laughs> has just got these spinning arms just kicking him like, a, like, like revolutionary wheels, kicking him up this elevator shaft. And it is just, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an image that has stuck with me since I watched it the first time. It is such <laughs> a cool it. robot moment. It is so cool, and I love it when he busts through the top and he just goes free falling off the side because it's like he didn't know when to stop. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that, that's what I got. That's my number uh, five reason, maybe. Yeah, I, that's that's a man. You know, like you said, it's one of those things you just automatically think of when you think of this movie. It's just like my next part that I've got, my next reason is the Robo Ricochet, which is the, when he's doing the oh, big yeah. drug bust. And he's got them all, and, this, and you get this guy that looks like Randy Quaid. <laughs> he's got the the woman at gunpoint. I'll well, shoot her. He's got the baby hostage. She's yeah, he's got the baby hostage. I'll kill her. I probably, we can't have that now, can we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know he tells he tells Lewis to put her gun down, and then he like just kind of points his away, and his uh, yeah. his super scope, you know, sets up the ricochet shot. Yeah, it's just awesome, man, because, you know, he's planning out just like shooting billiards here. You know, if I shoot right here, it's going to hit him right in the head, and everything's going to be cool. But I just love that the the crazy guy they got is, I mean, he looks like Randy Wade, Randy Quaid with a wig on. <laughs> <laughs> so that's funny. It. That's super funny, because so, I've got right here in my notes, I've got guy with the baby hostage, Randy Quaid. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, he's got the gap in his teeth and everything, man. Yeah, it's, it's almost like it's it's just him, and he just tried to put on a wig so you wouldn't think it was him. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, I can't be seen in RoboCop two, okay? Well, and I don't know if you've got this as a reason, but you you, you were saying that uh, uh, Frank Miller, he's actually in this movie. What? I didn't know that. Remember when they go to the uh, they do the big bust at the end, and they go in with all the cops. And they got that semi trailer in there. That's the actual lab where they're making uh, the stuff. Yeah. And there's a scientist that's hunkered down in there because it's going to blow up. That's Frank Miller. That's Frank Miller. Okay, there you go. I'll hang up any credit that I have because I had no idea. I tell you something even more interesting. We're kind of getting off base here, but I think this is very interesting. So there's a woman in the movie, the one that's got the baby. Her name is Linda Thompson. So you got the scene where they first go to uh, Kane's hangout, right? And they got the casket of Elvis and one of his yeah. guitars, and it's supposed to be supposed to be dead Elvis. Well, right. Linda Thompson was a I don't know if she was necessarily an actor at the time, but uh, she used to be on Hee Haw back in the day. She was one of the Hee Haw honeys. Okay, but she was actually having an affair with Elvis back in the day, and she ended up being with him those last couple of years before he died. So I thought, how weird is it that you got her in this movie and you got this, you know, casket of dead Elvis there? I thought, wow, that's kind of wild. So Linda Thompson was also married to David Foster, big music director. And she was also married to Bruce slash Caitlyn Jenner back in the early days. So the kids that Bruce has that have the Jenner last name were kids that she had with him. Uh, there is, I mean, there's a whole bunch of weird, you know, backstory there but i just thought it was ironic that here's a woman that spent those last years with elvis and here's dead elvis in this movie and i'm sure that wasn't planned i'll do you one better okay you know in in in, in predator 2 you know that the guy who who ends up you know the 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 uh the, the rasta drug dealer who gets killed by predator 2 it's bob marley what yeah <laughs> straight up now tell me this is going to be you and me forever <laughs> it's bob marley can I get a Helming on that? I was trying to get to it. <laughs> Helming. Uh, I just couldn't be one up by your Elvis knowledge. I had to throw something I'm like, in there. I think Bob Marley was dead by then. <laughs> in Predator 2, of all places. 
Yeah, Gary and Busey if he was a predator, too, he probably would have killed himself. So, yeah, I was expecting a Gary Busey joke. So, <laughs> yeah, Gary Busey brought it in there with the. You know, I got this agave nectar. Come on in, be on Predator Two with me. What you got next? Okay, what do I have next? Um, you know, I've already brought up the this sleazy lawyer guy, but I do want to point out how weird it is that he says. Uh, so you got this love story at the beginning of this, where you know Murphy's hanging out and he's checking out his his old wife's pad, you know and and she's freaked out because he's a creepy cyborg Chick- guy with, with a face and nothing else, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, so they have a, lo- a lawsuit against him, you know, and, and they're trying to get him to leave him alone. And the lawyer guy's like, do you really think you can give her? What, what do you think you can give her? Love? A man's love? <laughs> well, what does that even mean, man? Creepy Robo Kevin Nealon over here talking about a man's love. I'm just, just saying it's, it's, it's kind of weird. Yeah, yeah, it is kind of weird, but that's what he's he's tr- trying to hit him in, in the in the feels there of hey you you can't even you know you're more machine than man so how's this gonna work out right? Yeah, I think that lawyer is more machine than man. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to bring that up. It's a reason to watch because this guy is just so so cringy, and that's just another example. I'm gonna go with because you were talking about it. They were trying to go to the darker thing and get away from a being a kiddies thing, but. Look how many kids are in this movie, man. You got one kid that's a bad guy. You got the Little League team, <laughs> which is awesome. I mean, that whole scene is fantastic. But my favorite of the bunch has got to be the kids at the fire hydrant. <laughs> is the, the kid what? The kids at the fire hydrant. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when he goes out there and he turns the water off, and the one's like, you're out of your freaking mind. <laughs> <laughs> and the girl gets on his back and spray paints onto the head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, well, and that goes into the whole you know, plot point that, you know, so so when they rebuild uh, RoboCop, which you haven't talked about him getting chopped up oh, yet. Oh, yeah. But when yeah. they rebuild him, you know, they, they get community, uh, uh, they, they get a community council together to talk about what kind of RoboCop they'd want. So, of course, you know, they, they add all these directives to him, you know, being a role model and talking to kids and, and, and questioning things first and getting, getting consensus before he acts and not shooting all the time. And, and so when he comes out, he's, he's basically crippled by all these, uh, these expectations. And, you know, again, I, I do think that it falls in line with what this guy was, was talking about that uh, documentary that, you know, it's like they were trying to, to make him into this role model. So they kind of chopped up what the idea was you know they took all the yeah. the darkness away and you know just 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 to mention i have it in my my uh, notes here too that the the little league team that's taking out the pawn shop are the motor city <laughs> muskrats <laughs> and they're beating uh, the guy who owns the store with a bat it's such a great scene <laughs> and one man. of the kids is going harder <laughs> oh, it's well, what's funny is the coach is encouraging it he's yeah he's the coach is like VCR putting the stuff the in the back of the car <laughs> Good reason. Uh, okay, so I'm, right. I'm going back to the things that I would have remembered whether or not I rewatched the movie. And my next reason to watch <laughs> is the no directives found scene. You know, yeah. right after this whole thing where they where they rebuild him and they, they, they add hundreds of directives so he can barely even think straight. He right. hears the the uh, he hears the the lady who's kind of his his handler, his uh, psychologist slash technician. She says, "Well, you know." Uh, Short of wiping his brain or, or sending 10,000 volts through his body, you know, there's nothing we can do. And he walks right out the door, goes right over to a power station, you know, like a transformer, and he, and he just grabs it and, and shoots himself with all his electricity to kill all the directives. And uh, and then, you know, he's searching for directives as the, as the cops are carrying him away because they all kind of rally around him. They're all on strike and they, they break away. And, uh, and it says, no directives found. And I'll right. tell you... Just like RoboCop 2 coming up that elevator shaft. When I was a kid watching this movie, that no directives found, it was just like that, yeah, moment. You know, you just you feel like, yeah, now he's going to go get somebody. Then he tells them all to follow me. Uh, yeah, I've got it here. Robo gets juiced. Yeah. Yeah, I knew you'd be there, man. Oh, uh, yeah, I love that because he's like, he's hearing the conversation. He's like, screw that. And he just jumps up, runs outside, and electrocutes himself. It's like, all right. You yeah, I mean, because you know, it might have killed him, but but he, you know, he was like, yeah, it's better to risk it at this point, I guess. And then so of course kinda, he's got the line, oh. the the line oh, where yeah. they say, "What's bugging you, Murph?" Kane, 
Kane's <laughs> bugging me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they tried to do the uh, uh, kind of like what they did with the Frankenstein monster. They give them more and more lines. And I think some of them in this movie are a little more overstated, you know? Like, you know, when he when he grabs a guy, <laughs> you know, where did you get this? You know, it's like, okay. He's try, trying to put too much emotion into it, but you're still supposed to be a robot, right? Yeah, you know, I, I think I think what they were trying to do was, was make it seem like he was he was kind of a single purpose, you know, like he couldn't be uh, averted from from his one single role as the 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 lawgiver, you know, and and the the one problem on the streets or the biggest problem was the uh, was the nuke. We haven't even talked about that yet, but this whole movie is based off this drug, nuke. I mean, and that's even what they use to entice RoboCop Two to work for them is just by giving them, you know, drugs, pretty much yeah. un- un- unlimited amounts of, of of this nuke. And for this nuke, he'll kill everybody he used to be associated with. He don't care. I mean, it's it's all about just getting the drugs. And uh, it's an interesting concept. And again, you got to go back to Frank Miller all this because, you know, here's the upholders of the law breaking the law to create a force to go uphold the law you know and it all ties into it's still all seedy there's still money behind it all yeah you know, it, yeah it's it the really corruption sh- right sh- yeah shows how the, the how it's all corrupted and, and you know well, it's still pretty powerful I guess that shows how Frank Miller is perfect for Batman because you know Pat, yes. Batman works with his own code and he doesn't he's not beholden to money because he's got that and he's not beholden to politics because he doesn't have any need for it. Um so you know it's a perfect fit for Frank Miller. He kind of turned RoboCop into Batman where you yeah. know he's he's got a single purpose and he won't be taken from it and when people try and corrupt it and he finds a way around it. Um and you know, I don't. I don't know that we need to go through the whole plot. Like I, I, I right. know that I've explained some stuff, but I think that the reasons to watch the movie, you know, that the movie itself is fantastic from beginning to end. The plot is is awesome, and uh, just the the moments in the movie are kind of back to formula for us as far as like the reasons to watch it is because you know you're going to see some crazy stuff. Yeah. Well, the, you said it while ago. The dice. The, I, I got it as the dissecting of RoboCop. Ooh, it's 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 almost worse than the first one. You can tell they were trying. Yeah, it's pretty rough. And then you get the I got it. It just says Robo RoboCop, which is where they used a a dummy from the waist up, like a animatronics kind of thing. Yeah. Just, <laughs> and they've got him hanging up there, and he's just making faces like. <laughs> and it's so good. <laughs> I just think it's I mean, so like funny. you can tell it's not really a dude, but I mean it's oh, really yeah. good animatronics. They're really compelling because he's not supposed to look real. You know, he's supposed to look like a man machine. And I, I think it's just really, I think they did an awesome job with it. When they take his body and throw it out of the car right there at the, at the police station, they oh, just man. dump the body parts out. It's like, wow, how crude. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a great scene. I mean, like all this stuff with, with Robocop disassembled, um, it's, it's really uh, gruesome. And it does yep. a good job of kind of like pointing out just the diabolical nature of the bad guys in this town that they would just do this to someone, you know. Yeah, and maybe like like OCP, they just saw him as a machine. But at some point, you got to think. Well, and the kid, the kid says it while they're taking him apart. He says, "I hear he's got a brain. I want to see it." And this kid's right. like what ten? Yeah. So my next reason is RoboCop in front of a truck as a battering ram through a bar. <laughs> So there's this <laughs> showdown that happens. That old and scene first, is fantastic. <laughs> I, I, first of all, I want to say if you're if you're driving your your motorcycle past RoboCop, jump over him. Don't go past him because the two guys that jump over him, you know, they like use his crotch as a ramp. They're fine, <laughs> but the third guy tries. Well, you know, maybe I'll go around him. He snatches that dude right off that bike. So he gets on the bike. They play chicken. You know this whole chase scene, but there's this truck that that Kane, the uh, the drug lord, is driving. Robocop's on the front of it, and Kane just turns and and just drives straight through a bar. And it's like <laughs> from the inside of the bar, it's like you know where everybody knows your name sitting there, and and the truck <laughs> comes right through with Robocop cl- clamped to the front. You know, so it's like Robocop's back just busting through brick walls. 
It's a great scene. Yeah. It's so yeah, good. It's, it's like something it's really out of, good. you know, I come in peace or something. Yeah, it's it's full on late eighties action sequence here. It's it's fantastic. I, I, just just watching it again. I mean, I love the fact that when he get, gets on the motorcycle and Kane's looking in the rearview mirror and he comes <laughs> he comes flying by the truck and he's standing up on the motorcycle. You know, he's not with his legs bent, there's legs just straight, so he's just like <laughs> standing up on the bike going past him. Goes down and turns around, gets ready to play chicken. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's a chase sequence. I mean, like it's it's just it's right up there with Terminator Two as far as like yeah. just just great like car action. Right. All right, so just to recap, we got up to ten reasons. You know, number one is sleazy, sleazy Kevin Nealon. Number two is the RoboCop Two montage. Number three is the mayor of Detroit. So uh, got number four. Missing number four. Number five is RoboCop coming up that elevator shaft. Number six is the RoboCop ricochet shot. Yeah. Boom. Then you got seven in there somewhere. You got number eight is the Motor Motor City Muskrats. You got nine is no directives found. And number 10 is RoboCop coming through the bar as a battering ram. Rick, what you got next for number 11? What I got is... You gotta have the baddies, right? So you had Clarence Boddicker and his bunch. Well, in this one, you've got Kane and his bunch. And specifically, I want to talk about this one guy who basically looks like <laughs> Hugh Jackman and Joe Bob Briggs had a baby together. <laughs> <laughs> you are so right. <laughs> He's dressed like Joe Bob Briggs, but he kind of has a Hugh Jackman face. Not a huge yakman, a huge huge yakman. There's a, there's a difference <laughs> huge there. Yakman. A huge yakman. <laughs> well, he kind of looks like a yakman, I guess. You know, he's kind of <laughs> kind of got a nose on him. But he's you know got the full western attire on, even wearing a bolo around his neck. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's yeah, he's just, like uh, he's like a bad guy out of Dark Man or something. Like he's yeah. got kind of a shtick going the whole time. Yeah, he's a tall drink of water too. He is, he is. He he fits that long, tall Texan kind of thing going on here. But but he's such an odd one for the rest of the gang. Which how did they even get together, right? Yeah, when you include the the kid, you know, to be in your gang, it's like yeah, that's a weird situation. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I guess you know he kind of takes third fiddle for being. There's the there's the woman who's Kane's kind of kind of mall, and then there's the kid, and then there's Kane. But like this guy. He's always the first one that notices stuff's going bad. He's the guy that knocks out their crooked cop from the back, you know, where the guy's like, I love yeah. you guys. And he hands his bottle of booze to to, uh, right. to tall dandy there and uh, and do like wax him with a sap. You know, you, you figure for, for dramatic effect, he'd smack him with the bottle, you know, smash his own bottle. Against, but no, he's not going to waste that booze. He's he's smacking yeah. him with a sap that he had ready for the action. Yeah, I'm with you. That dude's bad. And just the whole setup with those guys too, because you know, like you said, you had the 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 undercover guy work for the cops, and the whole scene with him, you know, when they got him on the operating table and all that, it's still pretty pretty rough, you know. Yeah, I'm I'm with you, like, and and I've got that as a reason too. The the whole um, extreme interrogation scene where right. they, you know, he's like, oh, you wouldn't cut me in front of the kid. Oh, where, yeah, don't let the kid go. That's funny. The guy's just just desperate at that point to to try and convince himself that he's not about to yeah. get chopped up for the enjoyment of Kane because Kane is yeah. a psycho man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tom Noonan, best known probably for being in Manhunter as the Tooth Fairy, he's perfect in this movie to play Kane. And like you said in that part right there when he's got the guy on the operating table and the girl's like, "You just said you're going to scare him." He says, "Don't he look scared?" Yeah. <laughs> He also has that line, Jesus had days like this. <laughs> He's so bad. He's like, yeah. I mean, and, and I I know I've seen him in other stuff, but but I couldn't help but to think that he's kind of like Spalding Gray, too. He's just kind of a, yeah. I, I don't know, he's a, he's a weird, tall, poetic, bad dude, man. Yeah. I'll, Kane. Yep. There you go. Yep. My next reason, reason to watch the movie is yep. Kane. He's a casual wear model. He's a drug entrepreneur. Um, he's he's a psychopath. He becomes RoboCop too. I mean, you know, Kane is as good a bad guy as Clarence Boddicker. Not in the yeah. same way. It's a different, yeah. It's a different thing. 
I mean, because Clarence Boddicker had the benefit of just being like the head henchman. You know, he he could make decisions based on the fact that somebody else was doing the the work behind the scenes. Kane kind of had his own agenda, so he's right. kind of more of a mastermind. But I mean, Kane's a great bad guy. Well, the difference there is Clarence was backed up by, you know, OCP, whereas Kane's just doing his own thing. You know, true. So he's he's taking everything more, you know, he's more in charge of everything. Where Clarence was somewhat following orders and just, you know, gaining extra breadcrumbs for himself along the way. So with that being said, I'm gonna say Kane's out of body experience when <laughs> when they <laughs> when they pull his brain and spine out and they and, and, and but they left the eyeballs connected and <laughs> it's floating in that water and they're pointing at it and it's like seeing them. <laughs> And you know somehow those eyes sitting there look really like, like nervous or something like, like the shrunken head dude from uh, from Beetlejuice right. yeah. whose, whose head is shaking when he looks over at Beetlejuice. Those eyes have the same feeling, man. They're like, wait, you can't just because they they take his face off of his body and it's right there, yeah. and he's looking at him. Yeah, and they're like holding it, going, "Yeah." And if you look at this right here, there's this is where the brain was. You know, he, inside he's going, "Oh crap." <laughs> we we are in sync on that because I've got right here in my notes gory brainectomy scene. <laughs> so they take his brain out of his body, and then they have it in that 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 big tube, and they're talking about him like he's not there. I mean, it's it's a uh, that's horrifying. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say the um the contor- the contortionist fiddler in the. Uh, in the Detroit Telethon, right? <laughs> so th- this whole thing, you know, I'm not going to get into the whole plot, but you've got Detroit trying to win itself back. You've got OCP trying to buy it so that they can be the first corporation to own a city. And you've got the drug lords who are basically owning the streets. And so in order to buy it back, our favorite mayor, he has this telethon. <laughs> and, the, and the way they lead into it is, is straight out of this just gory scene right into the contortionist fiddler. <laughs> You know, yeah, like right I out mean, of that whole brain scene, they go right into this guy who is straight out of UHF, right? Exactly. That's like what exactly what I was going to say. It's like he you looks, turned the channel he's, he's just on this, UHF. <laughs> oh, my God. He's on this cheap telethon stage with all these people with phones in the background, and he's playing Born to be Wild on a fiddle uh-huh. while yep. he's got his head between his legs. <laughs> I mean, I wish I was making this up, but I'm not. <laughs> At the fact that he gets to the end of the song and he falls over and he breaks his fiddle, you know. <laughs> he breaks his fiddle at the end. <laughs> oh, my God. So yeah. if you haven't watched it in a while, like, just just find it on YouTube or something. I, I don't know if it's there. I'd be disappointed in the world if it wasn't. But the telethon for, for Detroit's future with this guy playing Born to be Wild in multiple positions as a contortionist right. <laughs> is just amazing. Well, it, it, it's funny because it's exactly what I had next on my list as well, was the telethon. Save Detroit fiddle player. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, they're, they're right next to each other. Like, you can't get a scene transition that's more weird than than a guy getting his brain taken out brutally and then repl- and then following it up with the uh, Born to be Wild fiddle solo by a contortionist. It's just, it's just yep. the weirdest well, and it, and it, but it kind of pays back to the same thing from from the original RoboCop, which you know we didn't really talk about any of the the commercials that are in the movie, which they're trying to do just like they did in the first one. But yeah. they try to throw this sense of humor in the middle, just a little dash of it in between to kind of break up, you know, some rough scenes. And this fiddle scene just falls right into that because right beside it, I had Sunblock Five Thousand, which is one of the commercials. Oh yeah. Uh, where the girl's putting stuff on, which is the the exchange student from summer school, is the the girl playing that part. I don't know her name, but she was also in summer school. Oh, nice. That's what I'll say. Well, you know, and and, and in the other one, you've got um got a, the guy who plays Clamp in uh, in Gremlins too, at the Magnavolt uh, car. Yeah. I mean, he's right. he's got a, a a car alarm that basically just fricassees anybody who sits in your driver's seat. Right. <laughs> Which is a good way for it to start. I was like, okay, I, yeah, I'm still on board with this. I remember it this. sets the stage. Yeah, and then later and you've it, got the one where the guy just kills himself because he got the wrong software for his company, <laughs> and that one's probably the most brutal. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> He's like, it took three days to download the information from St. Louis. 
<laughs> and I'm gonna die. And he's killed, I lost and the home. I it's lost so... the account, and then he just shoots himself. <laughs> And, they, and like as he shoots himself, they show a picture of his family on his desk. I mean, that's that's brutal stuff. <laughs> and, and this this is kind of getting to some of the factors that hurt it a little bit. But I said the whole final battle scene to me looked like a tool video. <laughs> yeah, because well, there's so very, much animatronics in it. Very not very animatronic, stop, the, the motion. stop motion. Yeah, yeah. From a standpoint of going back and watching it, that hurts it a little bit. Even though I love stop motion, and we talked about how it worked well in the first one but it's almost like they kind of overdid it with this one but that being said it's still a fun fight to watch well there there are two reasons to like that final battle scene and one is 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 what is robocop toting when he shows up to go fight robocop 2 he's toting a cobra assault cannon that's right that's all you can do when you got a robocop after you you just get into cobra assault cannon and the second thing is is the line that he that he delivers when he pulls kane's brain out of the out of the body where he looks yeah. over at Lewis and he says, Kane, Kane's brain's bugging me. <laughs> Hail Ming. <laughs> he, he throws Easily. that brain down on the ground. Uh, Easily a, fi- a top five line moment. <laughs> oh, d- definitely. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and then you, you got the early days of CGI happening here with Kane's face. At the time, it was it was very cutting edge. Now you're just like, yee, okay. <laughs> yeah, I think they use that same footage for the Lawnmower Man. It's pretty close, isn't it? It's yeah. Rah, 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 rah. I'm inside of a yeah. screen. Ah. Yeah. yeah, it's bad. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> but, you know. But, hey, it, it was the times. It was it was cutting edge of the time. I, mean, I can't say anything. I'm looking at my copy of Lawnmower Man right here on my DVD shelf. So I still bought it. <laughs> No, I mean, so, you know, I think Lawnmower Man, they probably had a little better uh, as far as effects at that point. So I, I'm a little more disappointed with Lawnmower Man, but definitely in 1990, they're making RoboCop 2. They, yeah. they had a great rendition of Kane's face on that screen so that mm-hmm. you could kind of kind of apply that bad guy to that robot. And I, th- I think it was a – I, 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 I kind of scoff at it, but well, I don't think it was bad. I think it still holds no. up today. Well, it made sense for what they were trying to do. So that's the thing you got to think about because they wanted a way for people to identify him as still being Kane inside of there. So they used his face. I mean, to me, it just makes sense because if you didn't, then it's just this big robot thing with no face or anything. It's just wandering around chopping up stuff, which is kind of cool in its own right. But for him to go back and face the people that used to be in his gang and all that stuff... And them recognize him just made him even that much more heartless when he when he kind of does what he do it does to him. So uh, I think it, it's got a purpose for sure. It's hard to, to to fault them for the big showdown at the end with the with with RoboCop versus RoboCop Two because that's kind of what the whole thing builds up to, right? Um, in a way that the first one didn't because the Ed Two Hundred Nine kind of would have been the the ultimate foil at that one, and the Ed Two Hundred Nine had already been proven to be bumbling. So I, yeah. I think they got the fight they wanted out of robot versus robot. It's just right. when you're looking back at it, like you said, it it looks like a tool video because it's just so much stop motion and you can't not see what they're doing. Yeah, but I think, you know, overall, it doesn't really hinder your enjoyance of the of the movie because you still got Peter Weller. You've got RoboCop speaking out of his mind and being Mr. Nice Guy. Because of what they did to him, I think it still it still holds up really well, man. It's it's still to me one of the better sequels of any franchise that's been out there. I agree. I think that it's unsung, but I think RoboCop Two is is totally worth a watch, and I think that it, it did everything it set out to be, which was to be darker than the original, to somehow be more poignant than the original, because it was kind of addressing what was going on not only with the franchise but also with the way that kids were being kind of pulled in as the target audience for something that was intended to be violent and, and adult. Right. I mean, it's, and, and I was looking in my notes just now and I noticed where I have rockabilly dealer. So, you know, we're in the same page there too. <laughs> I mean, it's a fun watch. And if you watch it enough, you catch the subtext that they were going for. So they did everything they set out to do. And I think yep. RoboCop two uh, is totally worth a watch today. Yep. And we're all on board with anything Kirshner does anyway. So, that doesn't Absolutely. hurt. So, yeah, right, you got, I, I can't you got find, anything I mean, else? Irvin Kershner is a great director. You know what? 
I don't. I mean, uh, they, I have little little snippets of notes here and there, but I think we All made right. the case. Cool. Then I say that takes us right into it's rating time. <laughs> <laughs> It's a new rating time? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it says rating time. I pushed it. That's what came out. Let's do awesome. that again. It's rating time. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> all right. All right. So you, you go ahead and give it a rating first because I think I've been stealing yours lately. Okay. I'm going to give it uh 45 cases of nuke. Oh, yeah, we, we are on the same page. I was going to give it, uh, you know, 10 red ramrod, uh, one white noise, uh, three blue thunder, or three black ah. thunder, and, uh, and of course, you know, one blue velvet. <laughs> blue velvet. It's raining time. <laughs> <laughs> You're ridiculous. <laughs> Uh, all right, folks, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Do you desire to add yet another entry in the endless legion of film review podcasts to your playlist? Can you not stand the thought of having any moment of your dull, pointless, waking life intruded upon with the sounds from the real world and would prefer to listen to a small cast of assholes talk about movies? Then they must be destroyed on sight probably meets your bare minimum requirements. Join Lee Russell, Daniel Harper, Paul Romali, and the odd guest hosts as they talk about films from every genre, ranging from the obscure and schlocky to the well-known top dollar classics. Look for... They Must Be Destroyed On Sight! On iTunes, Podbean, YouTube, and Facebook. That's... They Must Be Destroyed On Sight! Okie dokie, everybody. That does it for us. That's another episode in the can or in the bag or in the rear end. I don't know. Wherever you want to put it. Uh, <laughs> it's, well, it's like Dan Beasley uh, always says. You know, grease up your rear end. That's right. Keep that rear end greased <laughs> for longevity. <laughs> it's preventative maintenance. Uh, so, yep, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I have no idea what we're going to do next, but um, I'm sure as we as soon as we know, we'll put clues out there like we did last time. <laughs> I think people like that. I don't know if you saw it or not, Danny, but it said clues to next week's episode. It was just a picture of RoboCop. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and well, I think that it was astute. That was it was Matthew Tejan that came out with uh, that. It was Steel right. Magnolias, right? Steel Magnolias. <laughs> <laughs> You can always count on Matt. He'll he'll always throw a little curveball in there for us. And again, again uh, but like always, folks. Oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say Matthew Tangent also has his own podcast, the 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 good, the bad, the weird, and the cheesy, right? Yeah, some something like that. He picks a lot of the movies that uh, that we haven't done because uh, you know we we've, we've been kind of sucking up the oxygen for the awesome movie field. So you know he he has to go around us and do Zombievers. Well, I was about to say, the reason that he does those is because you won't watch them. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how about this movie? Nah, I'm not watching that crap. <laughs> Fair point. He does the work so we hell. don't have to. I don't have anything else to say. I, I just hope you guys enjoy this. Hey, let us know if you enjoy the shows or not. Uh, if we're If you like us kind of returning back to form, if there's some things you'd like to hear more of. Uh, if you got some sponsor ideas, we would gladly use some of your sponsor ideas on there. We'll give you, even give you credit for them. So, uh, yeah, man, it's, it's more fun when you guys are involved instead of just the two of us talking all the time. So sure. keep that in mind. Get on the Facebook page. Follow us everywhere we are. Even if you don't know where we are, just follow us anyways. Because that's kind of how that works. Yeah, no one knows where we are or what we're doing. Or what we are doing. <laughs> <laughs> but our um, legacy is resumed into the living yeah, th- rock of throw Stone out some, uh, I was going to say, throw out some sponsor ideas. I was going to say uh, Trinity Southern, Sutherland did a little while ago, and, and I think I butchered my attempt to, to make it. So, Trin, give me a second one. I won't screw up this time. That was a weird time for me. Any time's a weird time for you. That's absolutely true. But you know what time it isn't? 
It's what time is it not? It's trading time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what? But, uh, but uh, just either- like Rick said, come check us out. You know, look at everything we've got going on. Make suggestions. You know, movies, advertisements, sponsors, anything you want to hear. We're, we're glad to, to put our uh, our nose to the grindstone and make it happen. So just uh, give us a shout. We do this for the audience. So, you know, if we're not doing what the audience wants, then we need to know. That's for sure. Yeah, we we don't do this for you. We do it for the audience. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not mean. sure that's the same thing or not. <laughs> uh, well, unless you got anything else, I say it's time to say so long. What do you say? Farewell and adieu. Adios, folks. Oh, wrong button. (laughs) Imagine a future of abundance and friendship. A time where all come together for a common good and the benefit of everyone. Can you see it? Clean air, good neighbors, a helping hand wherever you reach. Can you see that? in your mind's eye. Okay, now think of the opposite. Now at a lot of guns, and a super addictive super drug. That's RoboCop 2. Well, good night and stay safe, minions. And always remember, actions speak louder than catchphrases. Members of the audience will receive the following. Classic Curves by Biddos, the pants for feel-good company. A gift certificate from Maru-Chan Ramen Noodles. Rice-A-Roni. All guests receive a copy of the Hell Ming Home Game. Thanks to the creative minds and special appearances of Mark Allison, Jeremy Finch, and Jacob Kennedy. Hell Bing is a proud member of Legion Podcasts. Check out all the great shows at legionpodcast.com. Hell Bing is available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and Legion Podcast. This is Dan Pardo saying good night. <laughs>